This is Bishop Gregory Brewer's sermon at Church of the Ascension, Orlando, Florida, October 20th, 2013. Let's pray again. Dear Lord, we thank you that we can gather together in the name of your Son, and we thank you that he is here. Help us, O oh God, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest that which you desire to say to us. Open our hearts, O oh Lord, and our minds. And we say to you, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We yield to you, and we thank you that we are yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If I step down here, can you see me okay? Yes, no? Good. Um, today the lesson is all about perseverance. That's where we began in the college. That preserve the works of your mercy, that your church may persevere, it says. Perseverance means to keep going, even when it gets tough. And there is a part of what it means to be a Christian, which demands of us perseverance. Jesus never, ever promises that if I give my life to Jesus, contrary to some preachers, everything's always going to be great from no matter how long, and it'll just be wonderful. And all of us know that that's actually a big fat lie. Although you can be in some churches where there is this kind of, um, you know, there's a lot of wounded pain going on in the room, but what everybody's really trying to do is act like cheerleaders so that we hope nobody notices that we're in a lot of pain. Um, it, there's an unreality about that whole understanding of what it means to be a Christian. And in fact, even today in the epistle lesson from Timothy, the reason Paul is calling Timothy to, in essence, press in and to be faithful is because two verses prior to where this lesson starts, he says, Oh, all of those who are ungodly will suffer persecution. And that's the reason he's telling him to, in essence, persevere. And Jesus, in essence, gives us the same message when he talks about persevering, especially in those times when God seems to be silent. And in fact, Jesus muses, as it were, at the very end of this lesson, when he says, you know, we could get so bad, he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he actually even find faith on the earth? It, it's really a kind of startling aside. Except that even though we actually don't always like to hear it, there's a profound consistency throughout the entire New Testament that if you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ, while God promises with all of his care to watch over you and to provide for you, he never, in the midst of that, promises that the provision includes no bad circumstances. Instead, what his promise is, is that he will give you what you need to face, as opposed to run from, the bad circumstances that certainly are and will be a part of your life, so that you can meet those circumstances with courage, with a sense of God's companionship, even in the midst of difficulty, and actually receiving from the Holy Spirit the wisdom that you need to look at those circumstances and say, okay, God, what do I do now? And know that God actually delights in saying, come on and ask, I want to give you the wisdom that you need to be able to deal with the harsh, difficult, tough circumstances that are in fact a part of your life. The scripture is extraordinarily realistic about what's it actually like to live in this world. And the good news is, is that the one who has ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father is someone who has known every inch of what it means to live this very painful and difficult life. It, it brings me, I don't know about you, I would hope so, since this is Church of the Ascension, but it brings me great comfort to know that literally within the heartbeat of, it, of the Trinity, in the very epicenter of the universe, there is a human body that has suffered and ascended, and through that body, pleading is made for you and for me to God the Father. I have never any right ever to shake my fist and say, you don't know what it's like down here. Just the opposite. 
Jesus bore every single, without exception, difficulty that a human being could face so that he could in every way, with deep integrity, promise that no matter what the circumstances are, I will never leave you or forsake you. No time, in other words, where God goes, oh, that's a little big for me, you're on your own. <laughs> no, 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 in fact, it is in fact meant to be that in the deep difficulties of life, we discover, in fact, a tenderness in the heart of God that we never knew. A level of compassion for which our heart longs. And those are not things that we discover when life goes well. And yet, more often than not, we do our best to try to live at a distance from both the difficulties of life that are outside, as well as the difficulties of life that are on the inside. And it's exactly that kind of artificial unreality that produces a level of cheerleading. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm walking by faith, right? Look at my fist. You see, there's a coerciveness in that. Like I'm trying to be my own cheerleader here, and I need you to be a cheerleader with me because I don't want to face what's really going on inside. And I use that kind of the joy of the Lord is my strength as an excuse not to face what's going on rather than equipment so that I in fact can face what's going on. We're really great at it. But here's the difficulty. I, I'm not trying to point a finger. I get this. And here's why. And I, I think I, I need somebody. Will somebody come up? Anybody. I don't care who it is. Roger, will you come up? <laughs> 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 you see, Roger was my priest, so he knew he <laughs> Here's what often is true for people who are living in the midst of exterior and interior difficulty of some kind, which is actually everybody in this room, right? Okay. None of us are without difficulty. And it's by God's design, okay? So none of this is like by accident. But here's what happens. For many of us, we have a difficulty facing what's going on inside which is what can finally take us to the place of despair, if we're not careful, that Jesus sort of muses on when he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find face on the earth? Because to not be in that place is in difficulty to be in a place of despair, meaning there is no help anywhere. And if, I, and if anybody's got to tough it out, I got to. That's despair. So what, what takes a person to a place of despair? And so what I'm going to do is give Roger some things to carry that are going to be symbolic and representative. I mean, this is actually a prayer book in a Bible. But it depends on how I read this as to whether or not this is comfort. I actually can read it, especially if I'm in that dark place, as a series of laws that I know that I cannot ever fully be. Bang. And so what begins to happen in that way is that the commandments of God, instead of being a place of comfort, actually become a burden. Because I'm feeling incredibly guilty about what it is that I'm not doing. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Now, it gets complicated and worse if what I do, I'm going to put some of this stuff on you, but I promise you I am not making you a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take my cross off. Right now, I'm giving him the cross because the cross is in fact meant to be a symbol of God paying the penalty for our sins and giving us his forgiveness, right? That's why the cross is the symbol of our faith, because he paid the penalty for me. But I can look at the cross in a different way. I can look at the cross as, see, I really don't have to face what's going on inside, because Jesus has already forgiven me, right? Isn't that artificial? There's something not right about all of that. 
So that, in other words, I use the cross as a point of escapism. Not to face what's really happening in my life. Instead of knowing that the cross is what allows me to face what's really going on in my life. Do you see the difference? So let's put this on, and for Roger at this point, being every man, not me personally, I'm putting this on him as a way to live in a kind of artificial unreality. I'm already forgiven, so I don't have to face what's going on. So now there's already an interior conflict between the commandments that he knows that he cannot keep, instead of trying to figure out what can I do, God, how can you work in my life to do something new in me that I might more fully live into what it is that you ask of me. I live in this unreality that doesn't matter what I do because after all, I'm forgiven, right? So there are now two layers of what in fact are burdens. They're not gifts of grace. They are burdens. Now, add to the problem, church authority. If church authority affirms either the unreality, if you don't have to face what's going on in your life, because after all, you're already forgiven, it's always going to be okay, that becomes a burden. Or, if the commandments of God are preached to you as law, and you darn well better keep it, or God's going to get after you, that's a problem, that's a burden. Or works, the worst cut, as it were, of all. If there are people in authority, whether they be parents, or whether they be clergy, or whether they be Christian leaders, lay or ordained, who somehow wound you, it could be the disappointment of promises not kept. It could have been because you've been mistreated. I mean, I don't know how many guys, for example, I deal with who really wrestle with the issue of God as Father, and they're men, and they don't know what this is all about because they have had awful fathers. So they don't know how to relate. Every time they pray, our Father who art in heaven, part of them inside this. So if, and if that's been a clergyman, if that has been a Sunday school teacher, anybody in authority whom you were supposed to look up to, and you've been wounded, by their poor example, misbehavior, just or you've just been wounded by them, at that point, <laughs> it's a new word. Now, here's the story. More often than not, this is the typical Christian. And yet, I'm supposed to come in and say, guess what, Roger, Krishna, the call of God is to persevere. So, get at it. And more often than not, what that experience, that experience like is, I'm going to Thank you. Thank you. Debbie, could you take this for me? Which is why the most important thing you need to be able to persevere is a heart that is tender to the presence of God. That is, without parallel, the most important thing. Which is why, thanks, you can say it. If there are places in your life where you have been wounded, which is true for almost all of us, it is critically important that you either go to someone and get them to pray with you, wrestle this thing to the ground in such a way, because what happens is, is that if we've been wounded in these ways, a part of our heart becomes closed to God and to His presence. Therefore, we're now in the double burden of having a heart that is resisting the very one who can give us what we need to be able to live into the difficulty of the circumstances. So I'm really all alone at that point. I'm actually worse off than a lot of non-believers, just in terms of experiencing life. Because I know things are not right in my life. I don't know how to go to God about them, because I'm not even sure God is trusting After all, look at what has happened to me. 
And yet, I'm somehow, I'm in the midst of that, trying to be good. And what that eventually can produce is either despair or genuine rage. And we wonder why somebody blows up, walks away from a marriage, or it's something that is just accumulated way, way, way over time. And it has everything to do with a, with a wounded heart that has not been healed not sensitive to the presence of God. And therefore, the promises of God to be with us and to give us what we need when we're in those places, it's like you know, water on hard, hard ground. It doesn't at that point even have the capacity to absorb the water that is going on it. I want to say to you, if you're in that spot, you need to attend to this. This is critical. Because anything else I'm going to say to you after this is just going to sound like a law that you cannot keep. Because there are three other things. Scripture, prayer, and availability for God to use you. The keys to perseverance, a tender heart, scripture, prayer, and an availability for God to use you. All of which are in the lessons this morning. But you see, the first scripture, I mean, there's this whole phenomenal passage in the Timothy lesson that was read about the purposes of scripture, to correct, to train in righteousness. In other words, to, live, to make you wise is what it says in Timothy. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the God-given ability to face your circumstances and know how to act, know what to do, to have solutions at your fingertips as you face the difficult problems in life that God only can impart to you, and your heart is tender that because you've literally been schooled in the Scriptures. You understand, because of the teaching of Scripture, the ways of God. You understand how He acts. You can hear the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel and go, yeah, I wrestled with God like that too. And I've got the limp to prove it. You understand that when Paul exhorts Timothy to spend time in the Word and really learn it, you know that what does the scripture say? It is life for those who find it and health to all their flesh. And you can, by your own testimony, say, you know, when I make the time to get in the scriptures on a daily basis, my heart is sensitive to the presence of God. I'm learning things about the Lord and myself that I never would have learned otherwise. I mean, it is the school of the saints. And it is irreplaceable. You cannot get what you need from God without going to the scriptures. It is the only document that we describe as a Christian community as literally God-breathed. That means when you encounter the Bible, the very life of God is coming to you. That's why John Calvin would call Scripture the sacrament of the Word. But, you see, if your heart's closed up, the call to read the Bible, yeah, I've done that. You know what happens to me? I just look at the words. They don't mean anything to me. I mean, yeah, I get, I see the things that I'm not doing, I see that. But in terms of wisdom, solutions for life, a, 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 an opportunity to actually encounter God through the scriptures, to receive that, doesn't happen to me. There's a reason it doesn't happen. And it has to do with this, that's in your heart. The same with prayer. The call to prayer, the story, the how much moreness of the Luke lesson, where he's trying to posit, you see, a, a, kind, a kind of distinction between the unjust judge who says, as he says, I don't care about God or people. But the only reason I'm going to answer this widow is she's an absolute royal king, and I want her off my docket. So I'll finally hear her case, just so I don't have to hear her nagging. Many of the people in Jesus' time would have understood that level of in, what, incompetence and corruption that was so much a part of the legal system. But Jesus is painting a contrast. God, who's the one, he's answering speedily. He's the one who's coming to the aid. That's why Jesus is trying to say, this is what you've understood authority to be, but I'm ready to tell you that it's different with God. But if you've got this in your life, you say, well, God to me sounds a lot more like a judge than he does when Jesus describes. It's right here. 
or even the final one for availability. When Paul exhorts Timothy in the Timothy lesson to preach the word, and you will know, many of you, the old King James version of the phrase, to be instant in season and out of season. This translation, the New Revised Standard, talks about regardless of circumstances. It means the same. It means getting up in the morning and literally, no matter how you feel, say, God, I want to be available for you to use me today. Wherever I am, whatever's going on. And I want you to know, let me let you in on something. It's so much fun. I love it. I cannot tell you how many waiters I have prayed with that I get into a conversation with at a restaurant. You, you see, when you're available for God anywhere, no matter where you are, no matter how you're feeling, God opens incredible doors and you have the thrill of actually being used by God to make a difference in the life of another person. Your gifts come to the fore. You begin to understand how God, by His Spirit, has gifted you, and a, and a ministry begins to be crafted. This has nothing to do with ordination, by the way. This is for all of us. And that however God is using me, you want to put your hand to it, because you have that thrill as you do it of saying, this is what I was born to do. But if you're this, availability feels like uh, something else to do. I, I just want to get through the day. That's why you have to deal with this. It has a profoundly negative impact on everything else about what it means to be a Christian. And you can dance around it. You can say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm doing really great. There's this terrible lie, provocative lie, in the book of Proverbs, it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction and death. And the Living Translation translates it this way. You may think it's a great idea, but is God convinced? <laughs> That's, it seems to me, what it's like to try to live in this bubbly effervescence with actually not dealing with what's inside. You can't cover this over with quoting scripture and doing your best to feel great. It's a killer. And finally, when you hit the depression button, because you just can't keep making yourself act this way, it's much harder to get out. So what's the word for today? It's perseverance. But if perseverance feels like a wall, like something I have to do, then you have to look at what's in this rather than seeing it as an opportunity to know the adventure, even in difficulty, of what it means to know and to love the Lord. Because perseverance, to those who have been healed, is an adventure. Is it easy? Oh, no. It can actually be agonizingly quite painful. Where you weep for those to whom, with whom you minister. When your heart is open to need in a way that you never, ever thought possible. Where there are times when it gets so difficult, you want to say, God, I just not, I'm just not sure that I can bear this level of burden. And then God begins to teach you what it means to cast your cares on you. You're not the Messiah. You're just one of his servants. And the role that intercessory prayer plays is you give and serve to other people. But again, you don't know that if this is what you do. So what is my plea to you. My plea is to ask God to help open up your fingers and open your hand so that the broken and wounded places inside of you can begin to be healed. That you might know the joy of the Lord. The real joy, not the effervescence. And the wonder of knowing that no matter how dark it gets, and it gets pretty dark, you always bear within you the very light of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that wide is the invitation that you give to us when you say, come to me, all you who are near me. Heavy 
and I will give you rest. But we also confess to you, Lord, that many of us don't know how to do that. We don't know how to come to you. We don't know how to lay down our burdens. And we're afraid to face the burdens that are inside. So I pray, O oh Father, that you would be to each one of us a very good shepherd. Show us how to do the things that we don't know how to do. Allow light to come in, for we are so cloaked in darkness. And give us grace, O oh Lord, so that we might give you the very cry of our heart and discover that you are good and that your love is profoundly faithful, more faithful than any love that we have ever known. So Lord, I just give you what we've shared now and ask that you would bear the fruit that you have determined, thanking you that your words do not return void, but carry out the purpose for which they were intended. So today, for those for whom this word is intended, let it bear fruit, O Lord, that more and more the Christians here might know in the midst of real difficulty, power, your joyful, loving, and grace-filled presence. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.